Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to go over the, the basics of the class, the format of the class, how it's going to be structured, and so on, and uh, go over the syllabus and things of that nature, the stuff that you normally do the first day of class. And we'll also get into uh, the actual material of the class, at least uh, start off uh, the class. This class, as you know, is a, has a lecture component and a lab component. So I lecture for the first hour. The second hour, it takes place in lab. Uh, and that's the time for you to work on any of your assignments or projects or whatever. And I'm there to, to answer questions that, that you may have about that. Uh, are all of you familiar with Canvas? Okay. If anyone does have a question about Canvas, maybe something that they're not sure about, uh, let me know. Um, I'm going to start off uh, going over the syllabus. And I'm, I don't aim to read the syllabus word to word. To, word by word to you because I think that's boring for everyone. Um, do take the time to read it in detail. What I want to do is I want to emphasize the, the, the main points of the syllabus um, so that we're clear on those. So, Help to turn off the lights. You're welcome to do that if you think. Uh, it will or turn off some of them. The top part of this, the point of this is to show you that there's a lot of different ways to contact me. All right. Um, you can call my office phone. That's probably not the best way to contact me because I'm not in my office as often as I check my email. So email is generally speaking better for me. You can either email me at my regular email address or you can email me through Canvas. Um, if you have questions uh, about the material in the class, if there's something that you're not getting and you need additional help, there's a few different places that you can get that assistance. Number one, and probably the first place to do that, would be in lab. All right? We have that lab time for a reason. So. You're working on stuff. If you run into uh, a problem, that's the perfect time for you to ask me a question. If you need addition, and you're also welcome to ask me questions during uh, lecture as well. If there's something that you don't get that I go over that, that you're not really sure what I mean or whatever, you know, raise your hand and ask the question, and I'll do my best to answer it, or I'll tell you that we'll talk about it afterwards in lab. Uh, so those are probably the first place for you to ask, uh, ask questions. If you don't uh, get the, the assistance that you need there, or if you're still struggling, or if you're still having problems with the class, another thing that you can do is you can see me during office hours. I haven't defined my office hours yet. Uh, I will, you know, by next week. Uh, but know that if those office hours don't work for you, I can make arrangements to be here other times. All right? So those aren't like the only times that I will take an appointment to see you, all right? Um, you can come during uh, office hours or you can arrange other times. If circumstances prevent you from coming into office hours, like maybe you have other classes or you have other responsibilities or whatever, we can always talk on the phone, all right? So we can make arrangements to talk on the phone or we can talk via Skype. You can install Skype, you can add me on Skype. The only thing I do say is, uh, or do ask, is that if you're going to add me on Skype and you want to talk and meet with me during, uh, uh, via Skype, is to let me know in advance that you're going to add me because there's a lot of spam Skype requests that you get and I just want to make sure that I'm answering, um, uh, you know, that I'm adding a student and not one of the spam requests. If all else fails, just talk to me. Send me an email, either through Canvas or my regular email, and we'll figure something out. All right? Um, I will do my best to help you to as great a degree as I can, but, you know, you have to meet me halfway. And, and meeting me halfway uh, really consists of letting me know when you have a problem and being open to different ways that we can solve it and figuring out what works for you. Because I'm convinced that if you have an issue, we can work it out. Um, if you're able to um, 
make the extra effort to come in and talk to me or, or whatever. All right. The other thing I would suggest is not to wait too far along. All right. If there's something that you don't understand uh, in week one, for example, or week two or whatever, um, not understanding that is going to sort of put you behind the rest of the semester or, uh, until, until you get, you know, until you do get it. So therefore, don't wait until you're absolutely lost and buried with late assignments or whatever before asking questions. A ask the questions as they come. The one thing I will do, you know, I feel it's, it's all right for me to maybe not directly answer your question, but to point to something in the book or something online or a lecture and, and sort of direct you to the answer to the question. I think that's appropriate. I think uh, that's a good way of teaching you uh, to be able to figure out problems on your own. So I feel okay doing that. Um, so if I don't give you a direct answer right away, that doesn't mean that I'm being mean to you. It means that I am trying to get you to the point where you can answer some of the questions that you have yourself. But I'll provide as much assistance as I can. If you still don't get it, talk to me again, and, and we'll, we'll go from there. So there's a lot of ways to get a hold of me, is sort of the point of all this. These are the outcomes and a description of the course. Uh, take the minute to, to read them. This is a book. You, you do need to be able to store your stuff because if you've worked on computers here on campus before, you know that when you leave, your stuff isn't there the next time you come back. In fact, when the computer reboots, all your stuff is gone. It starts with a clean, clean copy of the disk. So you have to be able to store, it, store your stuff that you're working on in lab. All the work will be turned in via Canvas, all right? So you will upload stuff to me. If you are having trouble uploading, again, ask me questions. Canvas will also be used to communicate with students. So check Canvas between classes. You don't have to necessarily go on every day, all right? Although it wouldn't hurt, right? If you go on and you see that there's, there's nothing new, then that should only take a second. But Check it between classes. Check it between the Tuesday and Thursday class. Check it a couple times, maybe, between Thursday and the following Tuesday. Because uh, I post announcements there. Uh, sometimes I get dates wrong on things, you know, and, and I, I might change the date of an assignment because I got the date wrong on it. Or if I said something in class and realized later on that I was mistaken, or if a student points out that I was mistaken, I'll post a correction. Or announces for things like, I'm feeling ill and I won't be in class on a particular day. All those things are things that I might post to Canvas. So therefore, it's a good idea for you to check Canvas um, periodically just to, to catch those things. All right? Uh, instructor approach, this is your class. All right? Uh, and therefore, your learning is really what is critical about, uh, about it, you and the other students in the class. Um, it doesn't matter if I go over the material if no one's getting it. All right? Um, therefore, I just want to reiterate that if you have questions, talk to me about it, and we'll figure it out. You know, a student asking me questions in class or in lab is not a bother. All right? I have students tell me, and they're just being nice, so you know it doesn't upset me or anything, but they'll tell me in lab, oh, I'm sorry to ask you another question. Like, don't be sorry for asking me a question in lab, right? That's, that's my job. You know, if I was sitting out in a restaurant some evening having dinner with my family, and you came up to the table and had your laptop and asked me a question, well, then maybe you should say I'm sorry for, for bothering your dinner, right? But in lab, that's what I'm there for. Right? So by all means, ask the question um, if you have problems. So anything I do, why you got a grade on an assignment? You know, why did I get a point taken off this assignment? Um, what does a comment mean? Sometimes in classes I'll write down a comment like, you know, minus one because you are missing ending tags. Well, maybe you understand what that means. Maybe you don't understand what that means. If you don't understand what that means, ask me, and we'll work through it uh, together. Also, if you need to miss an extended period of time, like not necessarily if you're going to be sick and miss a day, but if you're going to miss a couple classes because there's an emergency situation and you got called out of town or something like that. 
You don't have to go into details of your personal life, you know, I'm not asking for that, but just a heads up so I know that, well, you're missing, I know you're missing, and, you know, I know, um, you know, the, the, that you'll be back and, and we'll, we'll do your best to catch up uh, on the work. All right. Again, read through this. There's a whole list of college policies that I won't go over. Here's a mention about my late policy, and I think I'm very forgiving as far as my late policy goes. Uh, if I know a student is working on something and they happen to be late, I usually don't deduct if they're, if they're a little bit late. Now, if students, are, if students disappear, you know, they attend a class and then you don't see them for a while, and then around week seven or eight they turn in week two's assignment, I feel it's okay for me to, to deduct. All right, I think that's fair, you know. So keep me in the loop. Don't get too far behind. And if you're going to be late with something, you know, ask questions. Um, if I see you working on an assignment in lab and you're asking questions, I don't mind if you turn in a little bit late. Now, if you're late on one assignment because, gee, you're, you know, you weren't feeling well and, and so you weren't able to work on it, when you thought you were going to be able to work on it. So you, you, you turn it in a few days late. If that happens once or twice per semester, yeah, that's not a big deal, right? I'm not going to care all that much. If you notice that every assignment is starting to become late, though, that's a sign that something needs to change, all right? Now, maybe you need to spend more time reading the book. Maybe you need to spend time um, taking better notes in class. Or maybe you need to talk to me, and I need to explain something better. All right? I'm more than willing to meet you halfway. Um, I explain things the best that I can, and, and I hope that it connects with you. But I need to know that if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't, and if you're still not understanding something, I need to be given the opportunity to, to try to explain it in a different way that, that you will be able to understand and relate to. So, again, one late assignment, no big deal. Late assignments consistently, and especially if they start getting later and later and later, which tends to happen, then that's a sign that you probably need to talk to me, and we'll, we'll try to figure something out. Incomplete, the description of what that is. Uh, your final grade will consist of uh, the following activities. Homework, there'll be a total of 55 points. There'll be approximately uh, 11 five-point assignments. So you'll have an assignment most of the weeks of the year, but not every week. Uh, I mean, not of the year, but of the semester, right? So there'll be uh, 11 five-point assignments, all right, uh, homework assignments. There'll also be a couple special assignments. And if you, you know, 11 plus the portfolio, uh, plus the project. If you add that up, that makes up the 15 weeks. So there's pretty much something due every week, all right, except this week, all right. So every week from next week to the final week, there's going to be something that you need to turn in, all right. Some of them are just defined as homework assignments. Uh, there, there's a portfolio, and really we'll talk about this a little bit more. You know, we'll talk about this after we finish a lab or two. But the portfolio is simply collecting all your work uh, and, and, and putting it in a way where you can demonstrate sort of your progress in this class. And I think that's important to do. And it's important to do for a couple reasons. First of all, I think that helps you sort of consolidate in your own mind just exactly what all you've learned. All right? Some of you may not have done any web pages at all ever, may not have ever created any web pages at all. How many of you have created at least some web pages? Okay, a few, maybe 50-50. Maybe but some of you probably haven't created any pages at all. Well, you'll be amazed to see how you've progressed from, let's say, the first project that you turn in to the, the assignment that you turn in week seven or eight. You know, it's amazing how much that you learn uh, over a semester or even part of a semester. So this helps you see that uh, in, a, in a very real way. In addition, portfolios are often used for people in this field uh, that are looking for work. Uh, not that you would put all of your assignments on there, but you might put 
examples of your work, the examples of your work that you're most particularly proud of, on an online portfolio because that's a perfect way for people to check out and to see what your skills are. One thing that's great about web development as compared to other fields is you can actually do it yourself and use all, you know, use all the tools that professionals do and put it out on the web and make it public so everyone in the world can see what you can do. You know, a lot of jobs you don't have that opportunity to do that, right? If you were studying to be uh, an x-ray technician, you know, for you to practice your craft, you have to go work at a hospital, right? Uh, and, and do that. Uh, if you were going to be a nuclear engineer, you have to go and work in, at a nuclear power plant. You can't simply make uh, your own nuclear power plant in your backyard, right? That's not a good idea. But if you're a web developer, you can actually create and publish web pages out to the web, just like everyone else does, just like every other page on the web. And you can make them public, and you can demonstrate people what you can do. And showing people what you can do is a great way, you know, it's really a set, you know, in a nutshell, what people are looking for when they're looking to hire something is, can you do this job? Well, by posting examples and by creating a portfolio, again, not necessarily of all of your assignments, but uh, of some of the highlights of your work, you can show people in the world what you can do. So we do a portfolio in this class, and it will be all of your assignments pieced together. And um, then later on, if you want to go and you want to publish that or parts of it on the web, that would be something that would really be good to do. Um, portfolio is done in two parts, sort of part way through the semester. I want to see your progress on it. And then after we finished up all the labs, I want to see the last version of it. All right, so the portfolio is done in two parts. And those each count as five points. You then have a semester project. A semester project uh, is uh, creating a collection of web pages about some topic. It's creating a mini website. All right. Most of the homework assignments are about creating just one or two pages. All right. So you're not really creating anything extensive. You're, you're studying the techniques that we've done in class, and you're creating a page or two that showcases the, the things that we've learned. The semester project gives you a chance to put it all together and to make a, a bigger site that has um, a bunch of stuff on it, all right, um, that's more complete. And you go through the process of designing it. Uh, that is, you plan it out, and then you actually go and create it. So the plan, or the design, is worth 15 points, and finally, the, the final project that you turn in is worth uh, 20 points. And that should add up to 100 points. All right. One thing that we cover a lot, and I stress a lot in this class, is that web development really consists of, of two aspects, the design aspect and the technical aspect. The technical aspect is how you write the code to do what you wanted to do. You know, how do I make a link on my web page? Well, there's certain things that you do to make a link on your web page and to get it to work. All right. You have to know how that works for you to create an effective website. But just as important is the design aspect of it. That is, how can I make it clear to my users that this is my site's navigation, and these are the links that they should click on to get to where they want to go? And how can I lay out my page in a way that's going to make it easier for people to use it? How can I lay out my page so it's, it's appealing and pleasant and sort of reflects um, the character of the organization I'm doing the website for? All these things are aspects of design, and both parts of them are, are critical for a website to be successful. You could have websites that technically work, but are horribly designed, and people can't find the information that they need. And of course, if a website technically doesn't work, if, the, if, if it's created in a way that the links don't work, the images don't show up, etc., then it's pretty useless as well. So you have to get both those things right in order to really have an effective website. Um, that adds up to 100 points, if, if my math is correct, which I think it is. And it's simply then 90% of those points for an A, uh, 80 to, to 89 for a B, and so on down the line. Here's a schedule that we have. We tend to 
float ahead and behind throughout the semester. You know, we'll get a little behind and we'll catch up and get a little bit ahead and vice versa. So by the time we're done, we will have covered all this. But that's not to say that we, uh, you know, that, that we're always going to stick precisely to this. This is a good thing for you to see so that you can read the material, so you can come into the class having read the material. That sort of is the best situation when you come to the class already somewhat prepared. So the things that I go over should not be brand new, but you're at least a little bit familiar with them. And uh, my explanation can go into more detail. I don't believe in, in covering the stuff in the text page by page by page. All right, that would, that would be boring, I think, for you, and that would be boring for me. And if I was simply covering the, the book page by page by page, then, I don't know, I, I don't think that would be the best experience for this class. What I try to do is cover the same material, but give my slant on it, all right? And my hope is by me covering it and the book covering it, you sort of get two perspectives on the same material, and my hope is, is that those two together will, will make for a better experience for you and will make for better learning for you. you. You know, you'll hear the same thing presented a couple different ways and, and hopefully that will, that will encourage you to learn the material a little deeper than if you only got one of the two ways. So I don't necessarily follow the book page by page. That doesn't mean you shouldn't read the book because in doing that we'll get uh, the, the best understanding of it. I definitely will answer questions about stuff in the book. You know, maybe I do one thing one way and the book does something a different way. Well, you could always ask, why did you do it this way? The book does it that way. And I'll do my best to explain um, my, my reasoning for it. So between now and next class, go through the syllabus and read the details of it. The way this course is organized is like this. Um, there can be discussions on the discussion page, you can contact me, and so on. But most, <coughs> most of the action takes place on the modules page. There'll be a module for every week. All right, so this is the first week of class, so the week one module is available. You'll see on my screen other modules, but those haven't been published yet. So you can't access them when you go to your, um, when, you, when you log on to Canvas. All right, there, there are things from previous semesters I'm going to take an alter and make them work for this semester. So every week has uh, its own module labeled with the number of the week. If you're not sure the number of the week, you can look at the syllabus. This is week one, week two, and so on down the line. Each week will have what to do this week that covers sort of what the goals for the week are, what things you should do. Uh, sometimes I will include other activities beyond the book. For example, here is a tutorial that is useful in learning it. I would like you to introduce yourself using the discussion forums where you just say a little bit about yourself. And then finally, the assignment that's due. This is a fair use handout document, which we'll talk about in a minute. And this is your lab assignment, which we we'll, should talk about at the end, uh, towards the end of the class today. But this describes what the assignment is, and it's also the Dropbox where you can upload um, your work. These other two things are not pub published. They're stuff from other semesters, and I'm not using in this class, but I didn't delete them, just in case I needed them. So everything will be, each week will have its own module. There are two other modules that are important, and one is about the portfolio, and one is about the semester project. We won't be covering these today, all right, but read through them, all right. I have an overview, and I have drop boxes for the two parts of the portfolio. I have an overview, and I have instructions and rubrics for the two parts of the project and then I have drop boxes for them. So read through those. We will be covering these in subsequent weeks. 
Uh, probably uh, next week, maybe, we'll, we'll talk about the portfolio more details. Uh, or at some point, we'll talk about the portfolio. And at some point, we'll also talk about the project. So again, just like reading the book before we cover it, it's a good idea. Read through these other two modules. That's a good idea to do so before we talk about them in class. All right. But I will talk about those in class uh, later on. Uh, fair use. In this class, we, we create web pages, and as you know, critical to web pages are things such as images, you know. So, for some websites, I tell you what the topic is. For other websites, you get to pick your topic. And for the project, you get to pick your topic. So, let's say you decided to um, do a, a web page about the Cleveland Browns, about the Cleveland Browns last season, all right? And you want to have, I don't know, sad pictures, people crying, things like that on there. Well, maybe you can take pictures of that. Maybe you're at a Browns game and you took a picture. All right? you, could, you certainly could include that. Or maybe, you know, you took a picture of your brother who was crying after the last Browns loss or something like that. But in many cases, you're not going to have the photos to cover that. All right? You might want to use photos from another site, such as Cleveland Browns website or ESPN or whatever. Because we are in a classroom environment, you are allowed to do that, provided you don't do too much. All right? That is known as fair use, and specifically fair use for education. Now, if I ran a sporting goods store, I would not be legally allowed to go to the Browns website without their permission and use a photo off of it. That would be illegal because the Browns own copyright over those images, right? So that would be illegal if I had a business or even, believe it or not, if I just had a fan site. I was the, you know, we were, were the Browns backers and I have a site and I'm going to use a, a picture off their page. Strictly speaking, that's illegal. Now, whether they came after you or not, it's another question, because people obviously take pictures off the web and use them on their own sites, but strictly speaking, it's illegal. And because we're in a classroom environment, we're going to do things by the book, and we're going to do things legally, which means that fair use guidelines come into play. What are fair use guidelines? Well, it says, in an educational context, you're allowed to use stuff out of other sites, but there's some restrictions. So take a look at this. I'll bring this up on the screen now, and we'll talk about some of them. This is for educational purposes only, all right? Original materials must be lawfully acquired. So in other words, you could take it off of a website. You could take a picture off the Cleveland Browns website, but if you had a, if, you, if there was another site that was illegally using the Cleveland Browns pictures, you couldn't borrow it from there. If that makes sense. What can you do? Again, some of these things relate to to videos and so on. Some relate to text. They say no more than five by an artist, and for our purposes, we'll say an artist is a, a website. So you can take up to five, for an assignment, up to five images from a particular site. And the last thing is, is probably one of the most important things, attribution. You have to give credit for where you got the image from. All right? So if you had a site you know, if one of your projects was to do about the Cleveland Browns season, you took a picture from clevelandbrowns.com, you would have to have somewhere on your page a note saying, image from clevelandbrowns.com. All right? So, um, just, we're not going to talk about images for a few weeks uh, uh, now, or probably next week, actually. But that's just something to keep in mind as, as we go forward in this, in this class. If you use an image, again, for this class, it's typically image. Uh, it could be text, though. You might want to put a quote that someone said, all right? And if you have text, you can use up to 10% of the text or up to a 1,000 words. So you could put that and you could say, quote from clevelandbrowns.com or whatever, all right? 
It's really not that much different than if you wrote a term paper and you used a quote from a, from a book or something. You know, if you wrote a term paper and you quoted something, uh, then, you know, you should say, that came from, you know, either through a footnote or whatever, that came from such and such book. All right? You need to do a similar thing if you take images or texts or other stuff off of a website. So this would be another thing for you to read. All right? So, in a nutshell, Lab 1 we'll talk about before the end of today. We'll talk about that in the next 15, 20 minutes. Fair use handout, read on your own. To do this week, read on your own. Project and portfolio, read that on your own, as well as the syllabus. Now let's start talking about web pages. <coughs> web pages have a lot of different stuff on them. All right. What are some of the things that web pages have on them? Just what are some basic things that you'll see on a web page? Text. Text. All right. By text, I mean just words. All right. What else? Pictures. What else? Videos. Could be videos. All right. What else? Could be links. All right. Um, anything else? You cover the main ones, but there could also be audio. There could also be animation. Yeah. Yeah. A advertisement, which again, uh, usually is one of those other things, but yeah, it's a specific uh, thing. It is an advertisement. But you're absolutely right. Um, let's pick a web page. Um, I'm trying to think of what a good web page would be to pick. Does anyone have a good web page to pick? Yahoo. Yahoo. All right, sure. Let's bring up Yahoo. All right, so we have some links. We have, oh, forms, which we haven't, we'll talk about later on in the semester, but where you can type something in. We have images. We actually have a little animation here. And so on. I can actually see the code that's behind this. If I go here and say, view page source. And it's going to take a while because this is a big page. But we actually see the code behind it. And here's a good example of the code that we have. Right here, for example, I wish I could highlight this. Right here is a code for an image. How do I know it's an image? Wow. Here's an image. And that's one of the images on the page. I don't know which one. How do I know it's an image? I have this thing here, which is called a tag. All right? Critical to HTML are what are called tags. All right? In fact, HTML, does anyone know what HTML stands for? Hypertext Markup Language. Very good. It stands for Hypertext Markup Language. And what does that mean? Hypertext 
markup language. What do you think hypertext means? Yes. Information is transferred via text quickly. Okay. All right. Um, that's good. That, that information, let's focus on the first part of it. That information is transferred via text. In other words, if we look at this web page, we'll see it's all just text. All right? So a web page consists of text. But is it regular text? No, it's hypertext. Ooh, I wish I had dramatic music. All right? What do you think the hyper means? Is it like code name for like the tags and everything? Like they're specific? Yeah, more or less. Whoa, what, what, do, what do you say what, in sci-fi if you go to hyperspace? What does that mean? If, 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 if Kirk tells Spock, engage hyperspace drive, what does that mean? It means fast, all right? It somehow means beyond what's normal, all right? Beyond the normal amount. More than normal, all right? So in this case, hypertext means it's more than just regular text, all right? Because we identified all the stuff that's on the web page, right? And we identified more than just regular text. We identified links, we identified images, we identified text, we identified animation, video, and so on, and yet those are all conveyed through text, and yet we're able to convey more than just plain text. All right? So how are we able to tell the browser that, oh, this is, these are just words, This here isn't just words that we want to appear on the page. This is actually an image. We do that through the use of what's called markup. And what do I mean by markup? I mean the code on an HTML page. Specifically, I mean tags. All right? What do I mean by tags? All right? Some students like to write in their books, right? So let's find a book in here. Here's a book. So let's pretend this is your textbook. And let's say on the page 155, I tell you this stuff here is really important. It's going to be on the test. Some students will go and will highlight it. Some students might put a star next to it in the margin. Some students might put an exclamation point. Some students might draw a circle around it. What are they doing? Literally, they're marking up their book, right? They're adding something to the book that explains a little bit more than the fact that this is just a plain old paragraph in the book. This is not just any old paragraph in the book. This is an important paragraph in this book because it's going to be on the test. The flip side, if I said, this paragraph here, well, that's kind of out of date. Yeah, it was true when it was written in 2015, but, you know, stuff's changed since then. So don't really worry about that. You might put an X through it, all right? And in the same way, you marked it up. You've given additional meaning to that text, so it means more than it used to mean, all right? And that's exactly what we do in web pages. We use what are called tags to mark up our text to give additional information. So let's start up with some really basic tags. I'm going to create a fragment of a web page. All right? It's important to know that this is just a fragment of a web page. This is not a complete web page. And I'm going to use Notepad to do that. We also have a little application here called Notepad++, which we'll also talk about. All right? So, let's say I want a headline and then a paragraph underneath it. All right, let's say I'm doing a a news page for Lorraine Community College. So my headline is going to be 
spring semester 2018. I'm going to type in the tags, and then we're going to talk about them. much as I wanted to. I put tags around those. What do I mean by tags? Well, if we look here, tags start with the less than sign, they have the name of the tag, and then they have the greater than sign. So this is a tag. This is a tag. Strictly speaking, this is a opening. starting tag. Pardon me? Opening tag. Opening tag or starting tag. This is an ending tag. These tags go around the thing that we want to give some meaning for. Just like if I put brackets around text in a book, the brackets would go around the stuff that was important. Well, here the tag goes around the stuff that I want to treat differently than regular plain old text. In this case, the H1 indicates that this is a heading or a headline. All right, let's call it a headline. And an H1 means what? It means it's the top level heading. It's the most important headline on the page. So maybe I would do this. Maybe I would do this instead. LCCC News. Because that's sort of the most important heading. And then H2, I'll make spring semester. Maybe I'll have another H2 that will be the men's basketball. And I'd have a news story about them. LCCC's men's basketball team played Tri-C on... Just going to make something up. So notice what we're telling the browser. This is the most important headline on all the page because this sort of summarizes what the whole page is about. Think about if you're like making an outline in an English class. That's the main topic. This is sort of a subtopic underneath that. Here's an article about spring semester. Here's an article about men's basketball. And we could go so on down the line. All right? Now, this is the code view. This is like an x-ray. Right? We're seeing the insides of this web page. This is the actual code. And these tags indicate the meaning. So these tags are going to tell the browser, and remember, the browser is what users are going to use to view our web page. So Google Chrome, um, Internet Explorer, uh, Microsoft Edge, Safari, Firefox. These are all programs that you use to access web pages. So they're going to see this code and they're going to know how to display this web page because the browsers understand what the tags mean. So let's save this page and let's open it up in the browser. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to say File, Save. Now if I'm using Notepad, I have to change this from text document to all files. And then I'm going to give the file name of... Let's say news.html. It's important that I end it with the .html because that's what it is. It's a web page. And I'm going to save it on the desktop. All right. 
Now, how do I open it? And notice it's saved it on the desktop, and it has a little E, which indicates it's a web page. How do I open this up in a browser? I can double click on it. And it'll, it'll ask me what browser I want to use. I'll say Google Chrome. And it gives me this as a page. All right. So notice a couple things. Because of the tag, the tags told the browser how to display that text. All right. This is the most important title on the page. It's an H1. Therefore, the browser made that bigger than everything else. This is a second level headline. It's an H2. So the browser made it a little bit smaller. This is just a regular plain old paragraph, so it just made it normal size. This is an H2, so it made it as big as this H2, because these are of secondary importance. So, highest importance, secondary importance, secondary importance. Now remember, the tags indicate where the stuff ends and where it begins. So this tag goes around the text LCCC News. So this is a, page, this is a portion of the text that's going to be bigger. For every start tag, you have an ending tag. And what does an ending tag look like? An ending tag looks like the start tag with a slash in front of it. All right? So tags, for the most part, come in pairs. And those tags go around the things on the page where you're telling the browser how to treat that. So you're telling the browser, hey, this is a headline. So treat it like a headline. Well, what does that mean? You know, usually headlines are bigger than regular text, right? If you look at a newspaper. So it's going to make that bigger. Typically, the more important the headline, the bigger it's going to be, right? The, the most important headline is going to be the biggest. The second most important headlines are going to be the second biggest, and so on. You actually have H1 through H6. So you could do six levels of headlines. It doesn't mean you, can, you just have six headlines. You have six levels of headlines. Now, here's an important concept that some students have a hard time <coughs> grasping, but there's only one file here. I'm simply looking at it two different ways. Both these files, both this and this, are the same file, news.html. Just one time I'm viewing it through the browser, and one time I'm viewing it through Notepad. You could think of the browser as being the photo photograph. All right? Um, and the Notepad view is being like an x-ray. Because here we're sort of seeing the way that everyone sees the web page. Here we're sort of looking inside at the inside code of the page. All right? Now this is not a complete web page. All right? There's more stuff that we need to make it a complete web page. And we'll go over that uh, on Thursday. I do want to touch on your assignment because we have lab coming up now. Your lab assignment is to look at some of the topics that we're going to cover this semester. And to create a web page about them. Now, we're not able to do that yet today because we haven't learned everything about the web page. But you can at least get started on this. The three topics that I want you to investigate are HTML, HTML5, and CSS. All right, HTML and CSS are the two main languages we're going to talk about in this class. HTML5 is the most recent version of HTML. So I'm going to want you to create a web page about these topics. Now, that's just one web page. You don't have to make a web page about each one of them individually. You can put all three of them on the same web page. I want you to read about these on the web. And I want you to summarize what you found out about it. And I want you to write a paragraph 
about each of these. All right. Um, so in lab today, you can start doing your investigation and reading about HTML, HTML5, and the CSS. Um, when we cover a few more tags, you'll be able to actually create a, a complete web page about that. You get started on your web page knowing that there's going to be stuff that we're going to add Thursday that is necessary for you to put in. Are there any questions at this point? All right. Yes. Is our homework just the lab assignments? Yes. Okay. Yeah, homework and lab are sort of synonymous. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. We'll see you in lab. When is this due? Excellent question. Is due January 25th. So we actually have a little bit of time to work on it. Um, la uh, lab assignments, as per the syllabus, are due the Thursday of the following week. So if I make an assignment this week, it's not due this Thursday, but it's due a week from this Thursday. And it will be like that throughout the semester. All right, we'll see you over in lab.